Hello, everyone. Um, my name is um, Robin Wilson. I'm the editor of uh, Social Europe, and welcome to the Social Europe um, uh, podcast. Uh, my guest today is um, Devin Gallagher, who is co-author with Richard Cozell Wright of The Kiss for a New uh, Bretton Woods. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for agreeing to uh, talk to us um, today. Thanks very much for having me on. Your book with um, Richard, uh, Kevin, makes the case, as I say, for a new uh, Bretton Woods. So let's um, first backtrack to uh, 1944, against the backdrop of the Wall Street crash and the mass unemployment associated with the rise of fascism. Who were the key participants in the Bretton Woods conference that year? What were the key elements of their microeconomic policy agreement? And why was it so important for the stable development of the North Atlantic region in particular during the first three post-war decades? Well, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, and it's sort of eerie that... Uh, 1944 has some real parallels to the world we're in today. Uh, you could describe the world we're in today very similar to the world we're in, we're in in 1944. We were just over a decade of the worst financial crisis of the century. Right-wing populism was rife. There was an environmental crisis in the U.S. here. It was the Dust Bowl. And the multilateral system was broken. Uh, in 1933, there was an attempt to put together a multilateral economic system at, in London, uh, but the United States and, and uh, the UK famously uh, could not come to agreement. Uh, the world spun off of the, the gold standard and, and deepening depression and, and world war ensued. Um, but in the midst of the war, the United States stepped up to convene the Bretton Woods meetings. Uh, and in just a few weeks, uh, somehow, uh, looking at it in hindsight, uh, a handful of negotiators from from 40 or so countries put together a new exchange rate system, built the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and laid the tenets of what would become the, the World Trade Organization just in a matter of weeks. In terms of who was there, uh, the, the history books all put the United States and the United Kingdom and and in particular, John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White at the center stage. But a lot of, uh, a lot of research has shown that, that it was a little deeper than that, that actually developing countries had a big say in, and, uh, in the final outcomes. But uh, at the end of the day, it was really the United States plan with some trimmings on the edges that, uh, that came to fruition. One of the most important things beyond the institutions themselves was the overarching goals and the sort of... Uh, uh, the sort of principles that they were rested on. And the key underpinnings of, of all of this, whether it be the gold standard, the gold dollar standard, the IMF, the World Bank, was that these institutions should serve a world economy that had as its goal financial stability, widespread economic growth, and obviously with the Great Depression looming ahead, overhead, full employment. And that these institutions would be tools to be able to foster that uh, across the world. One of the key tenets uh, is that not only these institutions should steer markets to be able to do this, um, but that private capital flows really needed to be aligned with those overarching goals. And of course, it was done in the middle of the war. 1944 is not the end of, uh, of World War II by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, even though these are largely economic institutions to try to create economic stability. One of the most famous mantras of, of Henry Morgenthau, the uh, U.S. Secretary of the Treasury at the time and his chief negotiator, uh, Harry Dexter White, was that prosperity, like peace, is indivisible. Uh, what is more, they, they really had a plural vision of what multilateralism was. They said, if you want to be part of these institutions, you have to sign the Atlantic Charter, which has a series of principles, but it didn't matter what your political or economic system was, because they realized that these institutions are about providing global public goods. You can't really exempt any country from the solution, and can't, they can't be exempted from the, from the benefits and the costs. Unfortunately, as Richard and I talk about in our book, these institutions 
uh, and U.S. leadership in particular has lost sight of these underlying principles, and these institutions have lost their way. And here we are in the 21st century, uh, like I said, uh, looking at a world that is increasingly looking like uh, the space in between 1933 and 1944. We really argue, that's why the title of this book is called The Case for Bretton Woods. We argue for a Bretton Woods moment. I know we're in the midst of war and economic crises, but uh, the institutions that we have right now and the leadership is not fit for the purpose as we've unfortunately seen as as the world was unable to grab with the COVID-19 crisis and how it uh, racked the world economy. And now as we face rising interest rates and Putin's war in Russia, uh, we could really be at a tipping point. This is the time to act. Okay, Kevin. Um, that was very interesting what you were saying. Um, but you also say in the book that um, even within a few years of the agreement, despite this great achievement of the Bretton Woods Conference, um, opposition to it was stirring and this would eventually lead to its breakdown within 1971, a war ravaged US rescinding the idea of the dollar as global reserve currency and Keynesian demand management being explicitly disowned in the land of its eponymous author, whom you mentioned earlier, John Maynard Keynes, president of the conference, and made high inflation five years later. So where did this opposition come from? And how did it manage to unpick the Bretton Woods consensus, given its success over time and lead to the institutions, like you said, and not working so well as the decades wore on? Yeah, the system was never perfect to begin with, but it worked fairly well into the 1970s. There wasn't um, any financial crisis in the world uh, during that period. And since since the early 70s, there's been a final cr financial crisis somewhere every three to five years. Um, the coalition that, uh, that especially was overriding the United States and, and parts of Europe at the time uh, realized that there needed to be a social compact between capital and labor. Uh, but over time, the the, especially the, the different kinds of capital started to split where you had productive capital, people who make things and who do innovation, technological innovation and workers, uh, they started to split behind the, the financial capital. And as the world became more financialized, as the financial sector became sort of re-emboldened, they were sort of put in a cage because they are largely responsible for uh, uh, and the fact that they captured captured government responsible for the, the Great Depression and what ensued, they were highly regulated, um, but uh, but really uh, over time started to erode those regulations, capture government and play a play a play a major role. Uh, other documents have, have other excuse me other uh, scholars have really documented how big firms and powerful uh, countries. Uh, really mounted what amounted to a bipartisan attack on the state, uh, culminating with Ronald Reagan and, and Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the U.S. And, and its Western allies began to use these institutions to expand the market share of their large firms and footloose firms in finance, rather than uh, anchoring them to those core principles I was just talking about, rather than steering it towards stability, full employment, and prosperity, uh, the idea became expand markets for big firms and finance from west from the west in, into uh, into the rest of the world and so the agenda largely became getting rid of the state and, and some of these regulations that uh, that helped steer markets towards full employment financial stability and productive ends this led to massive financial crises of, of Latin America and Africa in the 1980s uh, East Asia and Russia in the 1990s and and we can't forget the one in, in Russia in the 1990s because uh, uh, folks haven't really pointed it out so much, but uh, but Putin came to power largely as a result of the massive humiliation of one, the sort of westernization of the financial Russian market and the subsequent crash, and then the humiliatingly uh, wrong and, uh, and, 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 and disastrous sort of IMF programs that followed uh, Putin really moved in and, and capitalized on that vacuum just the way Trump and others are uh, across the world. 
of course, this all came to a big head in, in 2008. That was the first big global manifestation of what was happening in developing countries every three to five years for, for a good 20, 25 years uh, at, the end of a, at the end of the last century. Uh, the lack of leadership and a, a proper response to these efforts has led to mass polarization, uh, accentuation of the climate crisis that we end up, and ever more financial stability. We were able to put the genie back in the bottle from 2008 after a while, although it spread to Europe and the instability has been there. And so when the COVID crisis hit, uh, it wrecked fragility across the world. And now we're really at another tipping point uh, with uh, rising interest rates and in the advanced economies and Putin's war in Russia, uh, the World Bank just sounded the alarm saying we might have another debt crisis like we did in the 1980s and the 1990s. That really doesn't square uh, with the world that we were actually having conversations about creating uh, right before COVID. In 2015, uh, the world agreed to a set of sustainable development goals, which on some level were the beginning of an articulation of a 21st century set of core principles that these kinds of institutions could be nested in, analogous to what was being thought of uh, nesting everything in 1944 in, but we have new realities, climate change, massive inequality, lack of health resilience, the ability of pandemics to spread across the world. The sustainable development goals were a core way to start pivoting uh, moving forward. And then, of course, also in 2015 was the Paris Climate Agreement. And so the, those climate and development goals are really the start of the conversation of how to embed our market system and our global institutions towards the provision of public goods for stability and realigning our whole societies towards those, uh, towards those, towards those longer, uh, larger goals. Um, but that has really been um, fallen by the wayside. Uh, over the over the past uh, over the past four or five years, to the to the to the conclusion that, that Richard and I have, and, and many others, that uh, that we really need to have fundamental reform. Now we need to reform those institutions, nesting them in that uh, in that overall set of uh, set of goals. We really need a, a Bretton Woods moment again. Interestingly, uh, Janet Yellen made the same call in April of 2021. Uh, in the middle of the IMF and, and World Bank meetings. Uh, she has just sort of called for this. In our book, we really articulate a plan of, of what we think it should look like. Okay, Kevin, you do obviously in, in the book make the case uh, for Bretton Woods to, in the context of the whole series of contemporary global crises, um, which uh, you mentioned, including the ecological crisis, which didn't seem to be an issue in 1944. Um, so then the question is, if we're talking about a Bretton Woods II, who this time should be involved? What should they agree on? And how would this put the world ship of state back onto a stable course and navigate safely through these quite um, disturbing global headwinds that we're facing? Yeah, well, at the same time that these forces that led to the demise of the system are gaining ground, let's, let's face it, the, the financial sector has actually emerged somehow from the COVID crisis uh, uh, stronger than ever, although rising interest rates and so forth are definitely putting stress. Uh, but an, but a, a reform of the system really does start with a new set of principles. Uh, financial stability, fuel, fuel employment, and, and growth, uh, as in 1944, are fundamentally important. But climate stability, resilience, inequality within and among nations, genders, and races uh, has to be at the core. And it really shouldn't be uh, enlightened hegemony, right? We've seen that uh, one country, uh, you know, the United States with, with the West uh, did have a, a, an understanding, I would argue, until the 1970s that if the world doesn't prosper, neither does neither does the Europe, Europe or the United States. And it's actually even more true now, given how globalized the world economy is. Uh, but given how globalized the world economy is and how many strong powers there are, this should really be a much more of a multilateral uh, engagement that not only engages uh, different nations from around the world, but different stakeholders, civil society, workers, entrepreneurs uh, across the world. 
uh, we think that the principles that one can find in the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement are a great starting point, as I said earlier, to, to re-embed these institutions. But then what does realignment look like? We really say there's about five things. First and foremost, just like in 1944, private capital needs to be realigned with these principles. Global assets, like the, the size of the financial system, has increased by a factor of like 80 since 1980, even though total investment, meaning investment into productive employment and so forth, uh, has stagnated, hasn't changed, right? So this financial system is feeding off of itself rather than fueling productive, inclusive uh, development. Uh, and self-regulation is obviously not working. It led to the financial crisis of 2008. And as we read in places like the Financial Times every day, when it comes to climate change and so forth, the entire sector is rife with what's called greenwashing, where uh, folks are, these firms are, are selling products to people around the world who want to invest in a new economy, uh, but they're not taking those investment dollars and actually making those, making those investments. Uh, those folks uh, had their chance to self-regulate, and now we simply cannot afford to let it happen. We don't have the time with respect to climate change, and we can't afford it because the costs of inaction on climate change and on social equality uh, are so high relative uh, to the benefits of doing something, and we are on a tipping point of social unrest across the world, uh, and we're seeing climate uh, damages around the world. So that's number one. Number two is that we need to we need to strengthen what's called the global financial safety net, regardless of uh, how well we regulate capital and we realign it with, uh, with goals towards financial stability. Unforeseen things do happen, whether it be a war or a hurricane that will cause uh, a massive financial crisis in a certain place. And the safety net that we have is not adequate and it's super asymmetric. Uh, basically, what we have is the central banks of the advanced economies uh, engage in expansionary monetary policy and create swap, swap lines with each other. And then the International Monetary Fund sort of scoops up the rest of the world, but uh, with a contrary set of policies rather than that expansionary printing money coupled with fiscal policy to expand economies that happens in the north. The IMF will also give you a loan and give you financing in dollars, but on condition that you implement austerity. And the record shows that, uh, unfortunately, that stifles growth, exacerbates inequality, accentuates environmental degradation, and actually, given the fact that, therefore, it slows the growth prospects of the countries that get these financing, it actually puts a, uh, puts a, uh, puts a drag on, on, uh, on global growth. So we need to refuel these institutions. And some folks might find uh, folks with a, uh, people like Richard and I with a critique of these institutions saying we actually want to give them more money. We want to really fuel these institutions, not just the IMF, but a new network of regional financial arrangements like the Chiang Mai Initiative, the Latin American Reserve Fund, uh, something that's in the works, which is the African Monetary Fund. These things can, uh, can, can play a better regional role and, and be healthy competition to the IMF. These things need to be uh, refueled up to scale. The size of the financial system, something like $500 trillion, but all of these uh, safety net kinds of institutions combined only have about uh, 1.5 trillion for emerging market developing countries. They need to be refinanced, but on condition that they are realigned with these larger goals that, uh, that I keep talking about in, in this interview. Related to that, some countries, and we're starting to see this right now, even if they get a loan that's more aligned with these goals and is counter cyclical, meaning that uh, that in Argentina, rather than having to have austerity, they can take a loan and do what we do in the North and have an expansionary plan to do infrastructure, put people back to work and so forth, get the economy going. So therefore you can pay your debts and investors are more uh, more confident in, uh, in your economy. Inevitably, some countries are gonna default on their loans and they're not gonna be able to they're not going to be able to finance their needs. And we're really on that tipping point right now. The World Bank has sounded the alarm with rising interest rates and, and the Putin's war in Russia and the associated sanctions. Uh, we are seeing a real retreat of capital from emerging market and developing countries to the dollar, to the safe haven of the dollar in the United States. That's making the dollar stronger. 
It's making these currencies more uh, weak in, in developing countries. And, but they still owe those dollar-denominated debts to the rest of the world, which were seen as in distress even before COVID. So now countries are, uh, are paying you know, 50 to 75 percent of each tax dollar to service external debt at the same time where their fuel costs are going out of control, their food, wheat, and grain, and different uh, food oil costs are going out of control, and they're still having to pay for monopoly, uh, intellectual property rights, protected uh, vaccines, PPEs, and so forth to try to combat the virus and uh, and not the recovery from the COVID crisis, which, as we know, uh, has has not has not gone on. And that doesn't even incorporate the fact that. Uh, the United Nations tell us is now or never in terms of climate change, that we have to cut emissions by 45% by 2030. And to do that takes a mobilization of an extra 2% of GDP each year in between now and 2030. So at the time where we should be collectively mobilizing a stepwise increase in finance to be able to make our economies more low carbon, more resilient, and more socially in inclusive, we're actually on the brink of a of a debt crisis with many countries, Sri Lanka, Lebanon, Zambia, Argentina, Ecuador, right? There's already been a parade of countries that are in this situation, and unfortunately, the, the line is quite long. So related to a global financial safety net, we desperately need a sovereign debt workout system that not only looks at those larger goals that we have and the realities of our financial mobilization that we need, we need to be able to have a systematic way that puts creditors and debtors at a table with equal standing that not only provides debt relief, but that links it to these goals that we have. Thirdly and relatedly, multilateral development banks. One of the other things that was established in, uh, in Bretton Woods in 1944 was the World Bank. And since then, there's a whole family of regional uh, banks that are analogous to the World Bank. They are also anemic relative to these needs that we keep talking about. They also need a massive capital increase by the participating governments, again on condition that they align themselves uh, with these broader goals. Finally, perhaps the most, uh, the, excuse me, perhaps the most uh, most important regime that that actually didn't get established uh, at at Bretton Woods. They had hoped to create a exchange rate regime, they did, the gold dollar standard with flexibility in case a country was uh, having trouble, they could they could uh, pull off of it a little bit to be able to reach full employment, the International Monetary, the World, World Bank. They wanted to also create something called the ITO, the International Trade Organization. We can't knock them, it was only a few weeks and they couldn't, couldn't create that one too. It actually wasn't until 1994 though that that turned into the World Trade Organization and unlike the World Bank, the IMF, and so forth, this is the institution and the set of agreements that is actually the hard wiring, the hard law that really does govern the international economic system and often isn't part of that conversation. And it is really skewed and biased and really locks in some of these uh, power asymmetries uh, in, in the world economy. The system currently fosters market concentration and, and climate change. According to the IMF, subsidies for fossil fuels in the world economy are $6 trillion a year, right? The, the world, on paper, the World Trade Organization is supposed to be getting rid of subsidies so that countries can compete. Uh, carbon protectionism is just, uh, is just, uh, is just off, the, uh, off the rails. And as we've seen in the COVID crisis, uh, uh, the intellectual property rules really fuel market concentration and monopolies, not free trade, uh, which has caused so much death in the world related to the COVID crisis, where the uh, advanced economies that, uh, that violated WTO rules to put in place accelerated industrial policy to be able to de develop these vaccines hid, hid behind and created protectionism and, and hid behind these intellectual property rules and left the rest of the world to treat the virus through infection and death. There's been a proposal to try to relax those intellectual property rules and waive them so the countries can protect and produce them, produce these vaccines themselves and, and avoid death. But, uh, but the North has been dragging their feet on that. 
that trading system also needs fundamental reforms to be aligned with this. The last thing, the fifth thing, is that major reforms in the governance, to get to your question, who's at the table, uh, the governance and the participation in these global institutions uh, need to be more merit-based and inclusive. There's been a secret handshake that's been going on since 1944, where the IMF is always run by, by a European and the World Bank always by uh, an American, and that the largest shareholders, the United States and Europe, have veto power uh, over, over both of those uh, institutions. And so the countries that need and are the biggest clients have little or no say in the design of the institution, what the loans look like, uh, and, and so forth. And so the decision-making power and the voice and representation of these institutions needs to be reformed to reflect what the world looks like now and the distribution of power now. We learned under the Trump administration that, uh, that it's actually dangerous for all of us, even the rich countries, if you rest all the power in one country. Uh, if the Trump administration had stayed there for longer, maybe these institutions would have been completely dismantled. He had taken us out of the Paris Agreement. He played golf during the G20, didn't go to G20 meetings uh, in the middle of the COVID crisis uh, and just refused to, to engage on, on a multilateral level. We can't we can't afford for, for one country to really have the keys to the whole world anymore. Uh, and we really need a, a, a global deliberative and, and inclusive process. Uh, what is interesting in the trade regime is that the WTO is actually one country, one vote. Effectively, uh, that has been somewhat violated because the rich countries have created a good coalition, a coalition among themselves. And it, uh, until China really started to embolden and have a large economy, they would basically condition access to their economies in negotiations uh, on the kinds of policies they want. That's breaking up a little bit because of the rise of China and BRICS countries uh, and making that process more deliberative. But unfortunately, because the West was losing ground at the WTO, they've gone off and negotiated a proliferation of 2,000 bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements that are much worse than the WTO, especially on governance. European and U.S. treaties have something called investor state dispute settlement. Okay, Under the WTO, if, if, uh, if you're European and I'm the United States and we both have industrial policies for our, uh, for our aircraft uh, uh, industries and, and uh, you, you don't like that we're subsidizing Boeing, Boeing uh, you can you go to the World Trade Organization and our governments enter into a set of disputes to try to work it out. And each government, at least in theory, is trying to trying to come up with a settlement for the best of its, uh, for, the, for, the, for the whole welfare of, of, of a country. That's not how it works under the new wave of trade or, uh, agreements. This ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, allows a private company to uh, directly go after a country without even, without even uh, engaging in notifying the host country where its headquarters are. So, uh, so a private firm in Europe could just go pick off the California government, sue, sue them for billions of dollars under a, uh, uh, under a, under an ISDS case. So we need fundamental reform of the governance of these institutions again uh, to align them with these fundamental principles of social inclusion, financial stability, full employment and good jobs, equality and gender, race, uh, and uh, within and across nations and climate stability across the world. We're really on a tipping point here. We really need a Bretton Woods moment. This world does look a lot like 1944, but that's also not just a source of concern, it's a source of hope, right? We were able to build a system in a highly polarized world that was at war, uh, that lasted for a long time. We need to do that again. Uh, we have been, well, we've been given a chance to do it in 2008, and we kicked the can down the road. We've been given a chance to do it in 2020. We've got another chance right now, and we can't squander it. We can't afford to do it. I'm inspired by what the world did in 1944. We need another moment like that, and it needs to include more nations. It shouldn't be in Bretton Woods. Uh, it shouldn't necessarily be in, uh, it could be in, it could be in Beijing. It could be in Bangkok. Uh, it could be in Brussels. Uh, that's not the that's not the idea. It just needs to be more globally inclusive. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, um, Kevin. That was a very comprehensive um, agenda you set out for um, a Bretton Woods 2 conference, why it needs to happen and what you should agree on, including who should be there um, if it does take place. Um, so thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, you've been listening uh, to uh, Social Europe podcast um, with um, Kevin Gallagher.